Good afternoon. My name is Molly Brunson. As faculty director of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program at Yale University, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the first installment of Visions of Ecology. This is a year-long series on art and the environment in Eastern Europe and Eurasia. I've been very lucky to work with Yelena Adesheva Klein and Barbara Bartonkova as co-organizers for this series. Together, we have sought to bring into conversation an international collective of scholars, artists, and curators to consider intersections of art and ecology in their work. We hope that this series is generative, informing new connections and potential collaborations, and also furthering the study of the environment in this region of the world. Visions of Ecology has been supported by the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies Program at Yale's Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies. I encourage you to join the RIS mailing list. We'll, we'll drop a link in the chat for information about future events. I also encourage you throughout the event today to drop any questions you have in the Q&A. We will have a period of discussion after both presentations. The title for our event today is When the Earth Cracked, and it will be moderated by my co-organizer, Yelena Adesheva Klein, PhD candidate in anthropology here at Yale University. And it is to Yelena now that I turn for the remainder of the event, please. Hello everyone, and welcome to the first webinar uh, in the Visions of Ecology series. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank my colleagues for their hard work on putting together this series, Professor Molly Brunson, Barbara Bertenkova, and of course, Christina Andriotis from um, the European Studies Council and Affiliated Programs. Many thanks to you. And uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers today. Professor Andy Bruno, is an environmental historian of Russia and the Soviet Union with an interest in many aspects of human interactions with the natural world. He works as an associate professor in the Department of History and faculty associate in environmental studies in Northern Illinois University. Professor Bruno is the author of two books and numerous articles in, and book chapters. His first book titled The Nature of Soviet Power and Arctic Environmental History was published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. And his second book titled Tangaska, A Siberian Mystery and Its Environmental Legacy just came out also with Cambridge University Press. And today we will hear from Professor Bruno about the intriguing history of Tangaska in his talk titled The Mystery of the Siberian Explosion, an Environmental History of the Tangaska Event. Our second speaker today is Anastasia Bogomolova, an artist and researcher. In their projects, Anastasia turns to the imitation of everyday rituals and studies mimicry as a theme, method, and visual language. Their work also focuses on the flexible nature of memory and oblivion, as well as on the depiction of traces. Anastasia is a winner of the Present Continuous 2021, a joint initiative of the VIC Foundation and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Antwerp, a recipient of the Garage Museum grant and the Credit Suisse and Cos Moscow Art Prize for Young Artists. Anastasia worked in various artist in residence programs in Switzerland, Sweden, and Russia. Anastasia lives and works in Yekaterinburg at the Ural region of Russia. And in their presentation today titled The Echoes of Collapsing Mountains and Cracking Earth on the project Under the Dome, Anastasia will speak about the Chelyabinsk meteorite, the largest meteorite after the Tangaska event, and about their artistic approach and the obsession with finding meteorites. I would like to thank both of our speakers for sharing their work with us today. And just to remind everyone, there will be some time for questions after the presentations. So please write your questions in the Q&A section of the webinar. And without further ado, please welcome our first speaker, Professor Andy Bruno. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me and thank you, Elena, for bringing us together. This is, I've been excited for this conversation um, and for the chance to present about my work. Um, let me, hold on a second here. Um, why is, okay, some things a little bit amiss with some stuff here. Let me go back. Okay, I go up there. If I go down here and then I do that. And then I share my screen and it should be good now. Um, I will just double check as someone once I've sharing the presentation. All right, is it all visible? Yes, it's all good. Okay, great, thank you. So um, what I wanna speak about today is uh, the project essentially I've just mostly completed in terms of the books out um, about the Tunguska explosion of 1908. Uh, the efforts to think about it and figure out the mystery of it um, and uh, uh, its sort of larger environmental history. My attempt to think about this event as um, an important and interesting and revealing event in, in global environmental history, um, as well, of course, as history of Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, one of the, you know, some of my larger points that I sort of start out with is thinking about that this event, and I'll tell you more about the event in a minute, um, helps us see uh, the potency of mystery as this phenomenon uh, that actually helps explain, you know, emerges in uh, moments of environmental history and, and, and appears and sort of affects the ways that human interactions with the rest of nature can occur. Um, now, well, let me unpack that. Um, that's a lot, saying a lot. Um, I mean, first off, I mean mystery in two sort of distinctive but interrelated senses. Um, one is the is mystery as um, some of the ways that the non-human world um, can evade human comprehension and understanding and control and mastery. Um, the fact that as good of scientific knowledge as we develop about certain things, um, the natural world, the non-human world maintains this capacity to surprise and um, affect and intervene and um, uh, influence um, human behaviors, human experience, um, to social formations, culture, um, and ways that are surprising. Um, and, you know, uh, for those of you who might have been paying attention, Bruno Latour, who somewhat influenced my thinking on this type of idea about, about the natural, about the potency of the natural non-human world um, recently passed away. Um, and I'm applying a certain type of um, way that the non-human world um, can affect uh, uh, human relations. It's also the case, uh, and, and this is sort of a more typical argument, that mystery is something that is culturally imposed. It is something that, that comes into being when um, human societies decide something that is uncertain or doesn't make sense um, has a mysterious element to it. Um, and that I think is really important um, in this story as well, because we will see how um, once this event gets classified as a mystery, it shapes all sorts of um, ways that people uh, interact with the landscape where it occurred. Um, and that kind of gets at the first of my three dimensions about what mystery's role in the history of this event. Um, one is that mystery solving shapes the role, shapes the treatment of a particular landscape in, in central Siberia for most of the, for the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, and this is different than, for instance, settlement patterns or industrialization or military um Backing up uh, militarization of a zone or agricultural use or pastoralism, but there's many other forms of um, uh, landscape interaction that we see of, um, sort of in the treatment of the natural world when I, uh, during the 20th century and beyond, well, and even, even before that. So it's a distinctive way that the, the landscape, this landscape where this disaster, this explosion occurs, um, uh, is treated. It also, the, the role, role of mystery allow, plays this really important role in allowing for the involvement of unofficial actors and alternative knowledge in 
the attempts to investigate and understand this phenomenon. As you'll see, there are people who espouse quite um, exotic uh, explanations about um, what might have caused the Tunguska explosion. And uh, these, uh, the, the, the fact that this thing has become a mystery by that point enables that and expands it and to come out in many ways takes on a life of its own. And finally, um, one the thing that I think is so interesting about this event is it allows us to explore cosmic disasters, this told category of disasters that um, we don't, you know, is we know is potentially, you know, from like the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs, potentially extremely important, but we actually have very little sort of a, uh, historical experience um, as human societies contemplating. And this is a place where we get to see you know, human society coping and, and dealing and engaging with this enigmatic disaster. All right, now, what was the Tunguska explosion? So in 1908, um, a massive explosion in the sky occurs on June uh, 30th, uh, June 17th in the calendar at the time. Um, this is in the sort of heart of central Siberia. Uh, I show you where on the map, this little black part right there is, shows you where it is. Um, and this explosion levels, you know, enough force that are, you know, uh, big, larger than Manhattan, um, with the trees all kind of um, uh, leveled and uprooted in a pattern um, uh, emanating away from uh, a central point um, in a sort of butterfly shape. Um, there are fires on the, the terrain. Um, the witnesses who see it, um, there ends up being hundreds of witnesses who see it. Um, most, the most, the most proximate are the indigenous Venki who are nearby. Um, but then in uh, trading posts like Vanavara, which aren't about sixty kilometers away, you have um, some Russians see it as well, see the explosion in the sky. Um, and most likely, this was the biggest. Uh, well, the, the, the understanding today is that this was the biggest explosion of uh, an asteroid fragment um, in modern times. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the event, um, there are people who get hurt. There's all sorts of rumors, including things like uh, it was the, the Jap Japan was invading after it was reinvading. Um, you know, this isn't far from the Russo-Japanese War. Um, uh, there's rumors, uh, and there is pretty clear evidence that at least one, possibly three, possibly more Ivanki um, died. And this is important because there's a myth about this event that no one died. Um, and um, one of the um, people who was closest to the event, he, um, if you were re reading the testimony carefully, it seems that he broke his arm and then it got infected and he was left in the taiga. Um, the, there's also, of course, ecological damage that occurs um, in the territory, um, reindeer herds that are destroyed, uh, forest that's obliterated, certain species that leave the territory, um, other ecological effects over the long haul. Um, and all of this, I think it's important to like, you know, make it clear that this was a disaster, right? Um, this was not just an explosion that had no effect on human beings or, or natural circumstances is clearly a disaster. And one of the things that's interesting about it is we can apply some of the theories that we have about natural disasters, charting social vulnerability, charting who's exposed to different hazards um, to a cosmic one, to a cosmic event here. Um, and that's a very interesting type of um, experiment that I do in, in the book. Um, it's also, of course, important to understand that, you know, for instance, um, the Messina earthquake that happens later in the same year kills 80,000 people in Italy. Um, so uh, the size of the explosion uh, was not directly related to how big of a disaster it was. It was a relatively minor disaster by all accounts, um, despite it being uh, such a huge explosion and had it hit in a different spot could have caused millions of deaths. Um, now, after this um, explosion, there's some, you know, there's some remarks in the newspapers, both in Siberia uh, or national newspapers in Russia, and internationally, um, about some of the um, white knights uh, optical um, phenomena that happened um, in the days around the event. Um, but then it's largely forgotten. Um, there's a few people who were paying attention at the time. It was only after the second, after the First World War, where you 
have this uh, intrepid meteorite hunter named Linnead Kulik, who um, learns about the Tunguska explosion um, from, from a colleague, and then uh, goes on these missions to discover it. And this is like, a, you know, sometimes, sometimes people matter in history. And this is one of these moments where it, it's very clear that um, someone else might have not just might have let matters be and we might have never really had this type of event develop into the mystery that it becomes um, but he becomes obsessed with this idea that this is such a big explosion and I gotta find it and this he makes his attempt first to find it in 21 and then he gets an expedition in 27 he has to rely on the help of Ivenki to get there um, because the taiga is so inaccessible at the time um, and what he sees is he sees this, um, he climbs up a hill and he sees this forest that had been knocked over um, and it becomes a sort of land of the dead forest, this sort of eerie place. Um, and then he quickly gets money to do another expedition. So that's all he was able to do in 27, but he gets money to do another expedition in 28. He brings a little crew. Um, by the middle of the summer, there um, uh, a bunch of them have scurvy. Um, and uh, there, the expedition isn't going particularly well. Um, a bunch of them evacuate. And at that point, um, one of the people who leave, but Kulik stays, one of the people, but one of, while after, after they've all evacuated Kulik's um, out in the taiga and uh, they uh, begin this media campaign about this um, scientist who is still out in the middle of Siberia. All sorts of rumors go around. Um, in some ways, this is almost a, a, a clever PR trick to get more funding for uh, the, to continue the expedition. But it also becomes known that there is this missing meteorite because Kulik does not manage at this point to find um, either a big chunk of metal, which is what he's expecting, or a crater on the ground. There's neither of these telltale signs of a meteoritic fall that a meteorite fall that he was expecting. And that's when you start the Soviet newspapers to get um, this idea of a mystery of a meteorite. Um, and Tunguska begins this, this process, this turns into a mystery and an international one at that because the foreign press is also paying attention. Um, Kulik, you know, again, could have left, left well enough alone, but instead after a couple months of rest, he um, begins another expedition in 1929, that one that lasts several years. And this is where he applies all sorts of mystery solving techniques to the Tunguska Taika, using everything from looking for magnetic items, geodesic analysis, drilling this big um, uh, hole, a big uh, funnel, big uh, uh, sort of release funnel um, from this divot in the ground, um, expecting that it's a crater, but then finding a, a live tree branch at the bottom of it. Um, it's also this moment where you get um, the collection of, of, uh, of event key testimony and other testimony um, and other samples. Um, the expedition itself is a fascinating story. Kula kind of goes nuts um, in the taiga. He turns on pretty much everyone who he brings out there from the other scientists, um, like this guy uh, with the long Ushanka ears down, um, Yevgeny Krinov, who's a scientist, to the guy who's sort of standing in between being, being held, um, who's this guy, Sergei Tyomnikov, who uh, writes you know, poems into, scratches poems about how stupid Kulik is, um, and denounces him uh, into the trees and the site, and then denounces him to the Communist Party authorities. Um, and this turns into a whole big, um, uh, problem, but the at the end, it, what's clear is that they don't find the things that they were expecting. They don't find evidence of a meteorite. Kula continues his efforts into the 30s. Um, he doesn't get back to the site until uh, 37, um, but is able to do an aerial survey then. They're planning a big expedition for 41, but instead the Nazis invade. Uh, Kulik joins the Red Army immediately, but is captured and um, imprisoned in a UOW camp and dies soon afterward in 42, early 42. Um, after the Second World War, a new sort of realm of mystery solving comes into the fore with the Tunguska event. Fiction becomes a sort of method of, of, of trying to figure out what had caused this massive explosion. 
there's all sorts of big contexts, everything from, you know, uh, the space age, uh, later on, the emergence of the Cold War, um, really importantly, the, the immediate aftermath of the explosions of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and Japan in 1945, um, as well as the fact that you have this sort of larger population um, in the Soviet Union at the time who have had this scientific education. Um, and you might think that being having a scientific education would lead people to be less susceptible to thinking some of the ideas about Tunguska that they do. Um, but it, but it's really a, a sort of realm of, of, of a realm of literacy that 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 makes them hunger for um, engaging in the scientific process themselves. Um, and you know, one of the first people who really, and probably the, and the most important person who um, plays a role in this story is this writer Alexander Kazantsev, who's a science fiction writer. And right after um, the explosions of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he he was actually um, in Europe at the time, but gets back, uh, and he hears about the details, and he says that this, this is his inspiration for writing the story of Rizliv, um, the explosion. Um, uh, and it's, it's a short story, but it ends with the idea that Tunguska was ha um, had to have been a nuclear explosion because there wasn't a crater on the ground and it had to be above ground. And so anything that could have possibly been had that much force would be an atomic something atomic. Um, and then he comes like, well, could a meteorite have been made of uranium? No. Um, what could have done this? And he comes on this idea that uh, an accidental space uh, crash of an alien spacecraft that was operating on nuclear fuel um, occurred over Siberia in 1908. Kazantsev initially means this as a um, as part of his story, um, but even by April um, of uh, months after his story comes out, the New York Times reports on it as if it was a, a legitimate theory that he was putting out there, uh, an actual hypothesis, even though the piece was clearly a work of fiction. Um, and that explodes the matter. Kazantsev himself um, helps stage a performance at the Moscow Planetarium. Uh, other writers get into writing their own sort of accounts about um, the nuclear hypothesis about Tunguska, the meteorite scientist who had initially helped um, Kazantsev go, go crazy and get all angry about it. Um, but as one of the people who um, this guy right here, Felix Zeigel, who was um, uh, part of the lecture at the Moscow Planetarium, um, uh, sort of exposing the public to Kazantsev's idea, and later becomes this guy, the, um, one of the founders of Soviet UFO studies, says uh, the genie was out of the bottle. So um, the there's um, begins this whole process of using fiction and fantasy um, to think about Tunguska, both from the realm of science fiction. So there's actually all sorts of relatively highbrow works of science fiction from the Sugatsky brothers to Sorokin to Thomas Pynchon that use Tunguska um, to lower brow ones, um, to also theories that are then put out there, such as um, uh, uh, there was a plasminoid or um, Nikola Tesla's death ray was involved in the Tunguska event. And these get put out there in the same similar vein of, you know, um, hypotheses uh, kind of taken from the edge of science. Now, the fact that there's wild ideas about um, what could have caused Tunguska could have been just like, well, that was a hub, um, you know, there was this moment and then it just goes away. But what actually happens is that in the late 1950s, there begins to be this whole group of voluntary um, researchers who decide to go out to the Siberian taiga to, um, on their own dime to investigate whether Kazantsev was right, whether it might have been an uh, alien spacecraft that was involved. And this includes several different groups, um, including, I think it's important to put out there, um, one group that was sent by Sergei Korolev, who was the um, head designer of the Soviet space program. Uh, he sends a small group out, with, in, which includes a future cosmonaut, Grigory Grechko, who look for, for signs of an alien spacecraft at this Hunguska site. Um, it also includes this group, um, the members of the complex amateur expedition that begins in Tomsk. Um, I got to meet some of the, the, the people who initially went 
out there in 2018 and have since passed. Um, and there they, they kind of take this, they both are interested in um, the wild theories, but also kind of take this agnostic approach as well, where some of them are complete partisans of the alien nuclear idea, but then others are will uh, find ways to collaborate with the Academy of Sciences, which is engaging in its own expeditions at the time. Um, and this is a very sort of um, interesting moment where you have, you know, these researchers who um, are, you know, with the Committee of Meteorites at the Academy of Sciences out there in the taiga with people who are, you know, are pretty sure that they believe that this must have been an alien accident. Um, and eventually what happens is that the Academy of Sciences crew um, decide that they think they solved the Tunguska uh, mystery by claiming that it must have been a piece of a comet instead of an asteroid. So that would help explain the trajectory it came in, that would expl help explain the energy, that would help explain the lack of rem remnants and a, um, and a, and a crater. Um, while these volunteer expeditions that begin, again, they begin in the 50s, but they go all the way into the 90s. Um, they, they're al occurring almost annually. Um, but the, res the volunteer researchers who are involved start doing all sorts of things like measuring for radioactivity, charting the tree fall of the region, to collecting various samples, um, both to look for direct and ev indirect evidence of um, uh, radiation or a nuclear explosion. Um, and also to get a, you know, some of them to more just get, uh, to look for possible material that could be um, directly linked to a meteoritic, um, the explosion of a meteorite. Um, now this whole endeavor um, creates this really distinctive subculture um, in the late Soviet period um, where, this group, um, the Complex Amateur Expedition, KSC, they um, create their own art, they create their own um, songs and poetry. Um, they have this certain sort of way, because they go out there for much of the summer, so they have this whole sort of, you know, um, tourist itinerary that they, they they take, but there's tourism with, you know, where and then they set up labs in the taiga and go out there and and, and do work as well. Um, and I, I mean, I argue this is a very interesting moment where we see um, the fact of um, engagement with the natural world affecting these people's subjectivities and these people's um, individual personalities and experience as well. Um, they produce things like, again, this um, uh, kurumnik, um, which is like a, an almanac, or a, it reminds me of a zine, like a punk rock zine um, that has all sorts of, you know, interesting illustrations and and poems and jokes in it. Um, they engage with animals at the site in various interesting ways, everything from trying to hunt bears to this guy, one guy loves, like sleeps with chipmunks. Um, they, they do all sorts of interesting things on the, on the ground there. It's also a very interesting moment to see some of the um, race, class and gender hierarchies of the late Soviet period reflected in this place. Um, when I began this project, I assumed that this was gonna be mostly men coming out into the on these voluntary expeditions, but it turned out that by the 80s, it was about gendered parity. Um, and you get, you know, for some women who went and joined, this was like a sort of moment of freedom. This was getting away from some of the confines that they felt um, restricted by um, at home. But for others, it was a, there was clear sort of evidence of, of um, uh, being, you know, preyed upon and, and, and uh, feeling uncomfortable um, with the behavior of some of the sort of more eccentric scientific guys in the taiga. Um, you also, of course, have the the relationship between the um, the hosting economy and these, you know, by these are mostly Siberian students, um, so they're they're coming with this sort of expectations of being cultured and having these access often to um, party. Um, uh, they're not a, it's not a party institution, but they have a lot of the people in it are, part, are party members. So they have these access to all sorts of um, uh, abilities to do things and 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 advantages advantages that that the people on the ground, the helicopter operators, and things like that don't always do. And of course, there's a really um, important uh, ethnic dimension that happens here. I mean, these are mostly Russians, um, and they're coming into Nevenki homeland. 
and uh, there's, uh, you know, the Venki themselves kind of become more marginal in this territory through this whole process of these expeditions. Um, and uh, the KSE um, somewhat appropriates a lot of Evenki folklore into their own sort of tongue-in-cheek um, ideas. So in initial Evenki accounts of the explosion, um, there was a spirit named Agdi that um, inter was intervening in a conflict between two tribes. Um, that's at least one sort of uh, story we have from the earliest sources about it. And Agdi becomes the god of Tunguska to the um, to the amateur researchers who, you know, carve his likeness in trees and um, um, embrace it in a very sort of playful way. Um, we also see um, the real, in terms of this tensions with this group, I mean, you see both the ways that uh, individual initiative could work within um, party structures, um, but also the ways that some of these people were, you know, become dissidents. Some of these people, um, uh, some of the leaders of, the, of KSE are, are ratting out on their friends. And there's these moments where people get arrested um, for, you know, having anti-Soviet literature and things like that. Um, and it creates a lot of tensions within the group. Another big part of this story though, is that um, mystery solving, um, this like the whole way that mystery this this landscape is um, organized around mystery becomes the fodder fodder for a um, campaign to turn it into a nature reserve. Um, there's a lot of things going on here, um, but the earliest ideas of creating a, a protected space actually beginning in the '60s. Um, but uh, by the 1980s, there's geological prospecting um, nearby um, and some sort of um, pretty uh, traumatic moments where researchers see parts of the, the, the expeditionary space that they were used to um, be bulldozed over by, um, by, by prospecting teams. Um, and they have this frantic campaign that at first achieves creating a Zakaznik, a temporary nature reserve uh, in 87. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union creates uh, the Tunguski State Nature Reserve, Zapovednik, um, in 1995. Um, and when I look at this whole process, one thing that comes out is just, you know, some things are pretty normal, like the fact that indigenous interests are play an afterthought thought, um, and that the protection regime that exists there today often excludes um, native peoples from a former homeland. That's a pretty common story um, with nature conservation globally. Um, but the the logic that emerges in a lot of um, the the people who are advocating for the creation of this reserve has this like really interesting sort of combination of a like Malthusian environmental concern. Um, with this, you know, lofty communist humanism. And it's a very distinctive way of justifying nature protection um, that uh, it's, it's mostly the people from the um, complex amateur expedition. Uh, and they, some of them become, you know, prominent in the early on in the nature reserve um, organization. Um, and then, I mean, after about, after, I don't know, in, in this, cent this, this millennium, um, so in the, the 2000s, um, by that point, uh, the fact that this has become a protected nature reserve actually starts to exclude and make it more difficult for the former members of these voluntary expeditions to continue their research without, you know, organizing everything with the central um, central institution the, of the nature reserve. Um, I finally, in the book, um, look so I, I've, I've mostly focused on the Russian Soviet story for many, many reasons, um, but the international story is interesting as well. And uh, it has its own, and Tunguska expeditions there and investigations, sorry, not expeditions, investigations there have had their own interesting um, character. Um, there's moments where international uh, researchers kind of you know, align with the Soviet perspectives. There's moments where they depart. There's moments where they're kind of fighting proxy debates with each other um, in really sort of interesting ways and, you know, taking, you know, kind of really taking different people out of context. Um, they also become, um, there's all sorts of kind of sort of wild ideas that emerge from, from international scientists, everything from the Tunguska's death ray idea to 
things like it was caused by a miniature black hole, um, antimatter, um, and then independently, they also come to this proposal that it might have been a comet. Um, by It was only, of course, in the late 80s that uh, foreign researchers begin to investigate, um, get uh, on the on-site, the Tunguska explosion. Um, and this includes a group out of Bologna. Um, uh, the first people to get there was a small group of Japanese researchers. Um, um, NASA sends some scholars there as well. Uh, and they begin these sort of international expeditions in the 1990s and beyond. And all this is occurring while several things are going on. So um, in the post-Soviet period, you know, the ideas and the alternative theories about Tunguska sort of proliferate even further. You know, people talk about there's a hundred different hypotheses about Tunguska. Many of them are on the sort of what they call the technogenic side of things, meaning, you know, might aliens or some type of other thing like that, Tesla's death theory, um, others uh, on the more scientific side of uh, matters. Um, but that's all happening while the science of near Earth objects is increasing dramatically. Um, this occurs with the Shoemaker-Levy explosion in, into Jupiter in the early 90s, um, the Chelyabinsk explosion, which we'll hear more about soon, um, in 2013, um, and the monitoring of uh, asteroids and, uh, and comets um, creates the point that, okay, it, it, the, the, the mainstream hypothesis is that it is a stony, medium-sized stony asteroid fragment that exploded in the air. There's all sorts of things that could have had enough energy to cause that forest to go down. It could have caused the shockwave that it did. Um, it could have set fires to the forest in the ways that it did. Um, the lack of remnants is pretty easily explained by there not being, by the amount of time that it took before any real research on it was, was done. And so things had, um, you know, the tiny dust particles had um, flown, uh, dispersed, um, in all sorts of ways. And this is the point where, you know, when the UN created International Asteroid Day, they put it on the anniversary of the Tunguska explosion. Um, so that's sort of reflecting the consensus that had finally emerged. Now, well, as I wrap up, um, one of the things that I, you know, like to think about and take away from this whole experience is a little bit different than maybe a typical historian would do sort of reflecting on the historiographical and, uh, importance of this event. I, I, I do use this to more reflect on what, um, what we might think about the environmental perils that we live in today. Um, and, you know, the, my own experience of, uh, I actually didn't get to set foot on the site in 2018. I only got to see it from a helicopter because there were forest fires that were engulfing the settlement. A year later in 2019, the forest fires were worse and this image of this girl with a face mask on um, from Vanavara circulated in the international media. And of course, a year later, we're all wearing face masks because of COVID. Um, and so, you know, that kind of got me prompted to think about it. And what I what I take away is, is might be counterintuitive, but it's, mu it's much more of um, the fact that we've lived with a disaster like this, the cosmic disaster, um, should really make us embrace planetary embeddedness, embrace the fact that we are on a planet as a uh, that's interacting with a larger um, cosmos out there, as opposed to do things like try to think about colonizing Mars and other other sort of escapist fantasies. Um, I take away from the this experience much more the need to stay with the trouble of our um, environmental predicaments than uh, try to transcend or or leave them behind. Um, and here's the book and thank you all. Um, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Andy, for such a fascinating presentation. Uh, and just to remind everyone that if you have questions, please type them in Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom screen here. And now I'm happy to, to invite our next speaker, Anastasia Bagamolova. The floor is yours, Anastasia. Okay. Um, good evening, good afternoon, everything to, to everyone. Um, okay, I will share my screen. Um, okay. 
Okay, here it is. Um, hope you can see it. Yes, we can see it well, thank you. Okay. So, um, first of all, thank you for having me here at this webinar. It's such a remarkable format and context. It's really nice opportunity for me to, to talk uh, about meteorites and uh, to share my work here. Uh, the project called uh, Under the Dome, uh, which I will talk uh, about today, puts together almost all of my approaches in artistic practice. Um, it combines uh, approach to materials, uh, tools, etc. many of what I turned to. And so I guess maybe it, it will be important to um, outline briefly this context before I talk um, directly about the project. Uh, first of all, um, oh, yeah, uh, like some of my projects, this one uh, unveil uh, my interest in studying the mechanism of memory and oblivion. But unlike others, like um, this project called To Grow From the Grass I Love, um, where I decompose uh, family memory or reflect on collective traumas, in the Under the Dome project, I examine commemorative um, practices in, in, in a more uh, broad and more abstract way through the study of the damaged landscape and through, this, uh, through the search of uh, ephemeral traces of, uh, of the event, which are um, preserved, uh, preserved only in conditional outlines. Uh, evidence of such events uh, is erased, witnesses vanished uh, or appear to be non-human agents. The scene of the uh, incident um, has no landmarks. Uh, contours of circumstances are found in the areas of uh, tangled memories on the maps of cities and regions in random craters etc. And uh, coming to these areas, um, uh, I aim to make uh, these traces of memory uh, and oblivion more visible. And I try to restore the missing things with uh, different, um, different performative practices, such as reenactment or um, site-specific installations or um, performance or uh, rituals. Um, and I take on this approach uh, in the Under the Dome as well. And uh, also in this um, uh, project, I work with photography as um, uh, in more performative way. Um, uh, turn images to the to the sculptures and uh, multiple projections to their uh, glass objects and so on. And also, I used uh, the journey, uh, the trip, uh, pilgrim uh, pilgrimage to to these uh, places where meteorite um, fall fell. Um, I use it as a self-efficient uh, medium, which also um, develops into the process of detecting different forms and signs um, and marks of memory. So um, I pay attention to the outlines of uh, the landscape, to different fragments, um, reflections, echoes, and I explore um, the process of moving to the mental uh, moving the mental map to the uh, topographic um, level, where the map becomes um, becomes the visible scenery of memory. So, yeah, the journey is one of uh, the most uh, important method for me as uh, in in other uh, as uh, in other projects which I made before. So today I'd like to share with um, some of the stops. Um, on this journey that started for me as a personal experience. 
and eventually turned into the artwork. So despite what I mentioned um, that I'm interested in events with um, a kind of conditional outlines, the starting point for this project was uh, absolutely non-abstract. It was um, the uh, project began on February 15 in 2013. Uh, just an hour after the huge meteorite uh, Chelyabinsk um, exploited in the sky um, over the, uh, the city. And um, the descent, oh, I have to, to play it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the descent uh, of this meteorite was um, caused by a series of shock waves. Uh, that uh, shattered windows, uh, damaged uh, more than 7,000 um, buildings and left 1,500 people injured. The resulting fragments were scattered over a wide area. And the biggest part of the meteorite um, was found uh, in the lake of Chibarkul. Uh, it's also in uh, Chilabinsk region, and it was raised um, from the bottom of this lake in October 2013. So this meteorite was named by astronomers as a, um, as a historical event, uh, the largest meteorite uh, after Tunguska phenomenon, and of course the most documented one, considering all these uh, numbers of videos and photographic evidence that remained after the incident. So um, such as uh, such um, an abundance of evidence was uh, made possible not only um, by surveillance cameras, but also by um, dashboard cameras, which are quite common for most drivers in Russia. And if you miss this incident in, uh, on the news or late night shows uh, nine years ago, maybe you may have, um, have seen a teaser a teaser of the fall in the opening scene of um, the movie Age of Tomorrow, directed by Doug Lyman with Tom Cruise. So however, by uh, the plot of this movie, the meteorite um, fell not in Russia, but in Germany. So the Chelyabinsk meteorite instantly um, entered everyday life and um, popular culture, in addition to memes there were uh, meteorite chocolates and candies. There, were, there was a perfume with the smell of uh, meteorite. Don't ask me what does it mean, I don't know. A huge amount of merchandise with um, a slogans kind of, uh, I survived a meteorite fall, uh, meteorite fall. And the first anniversary of this event was celebrated with the fireworks festival uh, in Chibarkul, and um, also um, uh, this um, uh, this anniversary uh, launched a few monuments, including uh, several private uh, initiatives, also in Chibarkul. So it was really a kind of uh, celebration, a holiday for people who greeting greeted together with. Uh, uh, happy meter right day. So um, an enormous, uh, enormous number of visual uh, uh, documents have extended their influence, not only uh, to the scientific sphere, uh, but also to the local mythology. For example, some uh, workers from Historical Museum in Chelyabinsk told me that um, uh, some of the visitors uh, made kind of um, mystical rituals around the showcase with the biggest part of a meteorite, which is uh, held in this uh, museum. Uh, and they try, tried to dance around the meteorite to, uh, to make wishes, to send messages to the space. So um, uh, meteorite became uh, a part of um, local myst uh, mystical uh, mystery uh, mythology. 
Uh, and also, I have to say that um, this abundance of visual evidence has um, contributed to the conspiracy theories related to the intervention of aliens or um, of the military. And uh, moreover, the war, um, more conclusions um, about the involvement of the army. So to insight uh, into this, um, um, I have to, uh, to um, clarify this uh, specific local, uh, uh, this specific local context, um, uh, the context of the place where meteorite fell. Because, um, for example, in Chelyabinsk, there is a military uh, airfield and um, planes, planes regularly flew over the city. Um, Mm, over the city and in the city of Chebarkul, where the uh, biggest part of meteorite um, fell. There is also a landfill for disposal of an, uh, ammunition and those February days of 2013, shells had exploded there and the echoes reacted uh, even Chelyabinsk. And uh, also, a uh, hundred kilometers from Chelyabinsk, there is um, another city uh, called uh, Azersk with uh, chemical plant where radioactive waste uh, um, are stored. And uh, there was a huge disaster um, accident occurred in 1950s there. So many of local people um, still remember that. And you can imagine uh, what soil for speculations uh, the meteorite fell into, literally and metaphorically. So um, at that time, I also lived in Chelyabinsk and uh, I watched this event from my kitchen window and I realized that I have to do something with that uh, almost immediately. And uh, of course, the stop, uh, the first stop on my journey to, to this uh, project was uh, to um, try to uh, research all these conspiracy theories uh, to uh, dig into the uh, local mythology, um, different um, personal mythology, which I began to collect among my friends, even those of them who was sleeping peacefully at the time of meteorite fell uh, and didn't see anything. Uh, they had already been uh, begun to build uh, their own legend about what happened. Even they they didn't see anything, but they tried to uh, to do something um, um, to rethink uh, this event to uh, to make. Um, their own story about it. And it was really paradoxical uh, effect for me. But uh, however, soon, of, uh, soon my scanning switched to other material, to meteorites that fell in my region over the past uh, 100 years. And um, uh, these uh, meteorites were not so documented um, as Chelyabinsk case. And as I delved to this um, history of meteorites, I wondered what type of evidence um, was preserved by them, uh, by these meteorites. What traces can be uh, preserved directly by physical landscape and how in the absence of visual evidence does the landscape um, remain the sole keeper of uh, these traces, how does it hide it? So keeping it in my mind, I began a long pilgrimage uh, to the places where meteorites fell in, and I tried um, to make the study of, um, uh, I tried to study uh, the local landscape. And I based um, my research mainly on archival documents on, uh, newspaper uh, articles on correspondence between local historians and scientists. Also, I have some documents uh, with correspondence um, uh, made by uh, Leonid Kulik. And uh, of course, um, 
I understand that little has been preserved over the past decades. Uh, the outlines of plains and forests, they are too large, uh, too impersonal, too anonymous. They don't offer places and objects uh, which are available uh, to the dimension when a human person uh, could see recognizable uh, markers of past events. For example, in, uh, in the end of 19th century, two meteorites um, dived in the, um, into the factory pond of Nezipetrovsk, uh, also uh, in Ural region, and they have never been studied. They stayed unnamed uh, and unknown. And it's difficult uh, to define also which of the river bank near the village of Krasnogorsky, um, also in Ural region, uh, became a haven for meteorite, which, uh, which was searched for uh, in the late of, uh, 1920s. According to a historian, um, it was taken by peasants, a local peasants, to the village and used uh, for construction of buildings. And uh, also, it's not easy to find that house uh, in uh, another uh, village, the village of Selizan, uh, also in Ural region, um, whose foundation is also made of meteorite fragments. Um, this one fell in the field, uh, probably in the early 1910s, and first it was found by a school teacher who, uh, who went hunting, and he came back to this place in 10 years, and he couldn't um, find anything. So um, also, um, uh, for example, years um, later, no traces of the Kataf Ivanovsk meteorite can be found. This meteorite fell in, 19, uh, in, the, uh, in the spring of 1941. It was a really remarkable uh, case, um, uh, thanks to the, uh, its um, huge funnel, and a well, um, as well as a huge mass of something blood red color. Uh, which was observed by locals, uh, but the study of uh, this meteorite was cancelled since the USSR entered uh, the world, um, world the second. So in my journey, I have taken the position of um, kind of pilgrim who creates their own legendary topography uh, and um, I use as a reference the book by Maris uh, Halbvox, the book called The Legendary Topography of the Gospels in the Ho Holy Land, where uh, French philosopher explored uh, the process of uh, moving to moving the mental map to a topographical level. Halbvox um, studied uh, the use of geographical location as a base of uh, tradition of commemoration. And he considered this phenomenon uh, an example of Christian pilgrims who went to the Holy Lands centuries after alleged death of Christ. And Halbwax interested more in the image of representation of these commemorative uh, places. He left aside all the questions of um, intellectual content uh, of the Christian tradition. And instead of that, he focused um, on decoding the forms of its, um, uh, 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 of its uh, representation. So pilgrims, um, except in his um, book, pilgrims were walking through the Holy Lands, a time when, of course, nothing have uh, had survived from the supposed era of Christ, and they give um, give certain sacred meanings to the specific uh, geographical um, places that correspond their own ideas, their own expectations, uh, roads, stones on the paths and caves, etc. And this process of commemoration contributed to the stability of uh, the official uh, religious uh, tradition. So it may, <laughs> it may um, sound, uh, sound um, unexpected maybe, but in my project, I followed the same pattern 
uh, as the pilgrim uh, in search of relevant uh, points um, um, of the map. Um, and I, um, in search of these points, I um, traveled around the Ural region, examining uh, the destroyed houses or funnels in the meadow or thickets of reeds or cracked mountains, etc. And in most cases, I'm um, not certain about the location uh, of places mentioned in archival materials uh, or newspaper articles. Moving across the landscape, I do not find any signposts or memorials, of course. I only assumed um, that the ruined house I found the, uh, or the crater on the meadow or the bone of the ground, this is uh, exactly <laughs> the territory I was looking for. So, and when I come uh, to these areas, I try to make these traces more visible. And the key, and I uh, have uh, several key images as a reference uh, for this work. Um, these um, key, uh, these, um, Images are common for most of the evidence uh, associated not only with Chelyabinsk meteorite, but also with many others uh, that I studied in my region. And the first uh, key image is a smoky trail from, uh, from the fall, uh, falling uh, and explosion of meteorites in the sky. The description of this trace is uh, found in evidence as one of the most disturbance sign. The trail cuts uh, through the night or morning sky. Uh, the trail stretches, uh, stretches of the, you know, the forest. The trail uh, dives precisely into the landscape, marking areas of meteorite uh, shower, etc. And I get back to this uh, ephemeral and elusive trace um, in a series of my performative reenactments at meteorite uh, at meteorite sites, um, I based uh, I based this um, work on documentary evidence, but I'm not engaged um, in a literal representation of um, specific episodes. Um, although you can find some visual hints in my. Um, in, in the documentation of my uh, research process uh, in the installation part. Uh, but I'm more um, fascinated by the possibility um, to recreate an, a general a common image uh, of a catastrophe, of anxiety and damage caused by something completely uncontrollable. Um, so here are some pictures of this reenactments. Um, and the second image as a reference for the project is shots. First of all, uh, fragments of broken windows, glass shots. I began to collect them, um, uh, first of all, near my home, uh, near, uh, near my house, uh, then around the city. Uh, where um, there were especially many of them in the first days after Chelyabinsk uh, meteorite. And these glass shards um, seem to me more as a symbolic objects, uh, kind of uh, fragments of a broken dome. Now I uh, speak more metaf metaphorically. A broken dome which had previously looked safe, um, protecting from the contact uh, of a dark block uh, of timeless space. And now this uh, barrier no longer existed. And now this dome was so tangible and so fragile. Its fragments are um, um, rapidly scattered around. They dig into the landscape. They throw up uh, the grass and a uh, clot of soils, etc. So um, uh, contemplating uh, these symbolic traces, I created a series of glass objects to bring and to bring them to life. I worked with numerous images uh, taken at various meteorite impact sites during my journeys. 
And then I, um, I projected them uh, onto the uh, broken mirrors. Uh, and after that, I re-reflected them on, uh, onto the dark backgrounds and only then I uh, fixed the final image. So it was a multiple projection. Uh, in some shots, uh, you can uh, recognize um, specific details. So you can notice fields or figures of uh, fishermen or on the lake or houses, forests, damaged uh, trees. But the most important fragments um, are abstract, uh, I guess, because they provide a room for conjecture. For me, they are a more... Um, works as um, embodiment of the elusiveness and erasion on the trace that become conditional. So in the exhibition space, these glass objects are combined with uh, ready-made uh, with window frames knocked out by a blast wave uh, during the meteorite uh, fall in Chelyabinsk. So it's literally documented shots and uh, documented traces. And also, um, you uh, you can uh, you can hear uh, um, the sound of glass shots uh, in their um, installation made in the form of uh, nearly destroyed uh, false ceiling with hanging lead lamp. Uh, this sound for installation is assembled from real video recordings and modification of uh, infrasound of meteorite fall, but I will come back to this sound a little bit later. And uh, finally, the third uh, documentary reference for my work um, uh, was a variety of destruction forms. Uh, this is uh, evidence of broken roofs, uh, cut trees, uh, as well as funnels on the meadows, smashed land, uh, and so on. And starting from the idea of creating new broken forms and outlines of the uh, landscape, I also created a series of uh, photo sculptures from galvanized steel. Um, and these works are also based uh, on images uh, taken at the sites of meteorite impacts. So um, their broken abstract forms and pictures uh, imitating them embody this um, symbolic uh, image of the natural and urban landscape destroyed by a space invasion by something absolutely uncontrollable. Uh, and all these elements accumulate uh, the memory of the event uh, and allow um, a person who gets into the project space to feel the excitement and fear and um, experience of loneliness uh, in the face of this uncontrollable event. So a quote from the book um, by Tove Janssen, a uh, book, Comet in the Moment Land, uh, may seem also unexpected in this context, but I use it as an ep epigraph uh, for my work because uh, it paradoxically uh, reflects um, this effect that I put into this work to um, the effect of uh, fear and feeling of catastrophe and um, something uncontrollable. This year, um, the catastrophe, uh, less abstract, as I may say, uh, than the uh, meteor, uh, meteorite strike, um, forced me to rethink uh, all this project uh, and all my previous work as well and um, to revise at least one of the parts of the Under the Dome project. In the summer, I launched uh, the so-called host gallery called Guest, uh, right in my artist studio here in Yekaterinburg. And according to the concept of um, this uh, space, on some days, um, the artist studio uh, works as an exhibition space where you could see uh, you where you could see um, 
the projects of other artists. And by accepting an invitation and becoming guests in my studio, uh, artists uh, allow me to become a guest to, in relation to their work. So uh, to enter a dialogue with them through new or previous artwork. And one of the exhibition was um, um, Rust the Way You Are by Anna Snegina. She's also a uh, Ural artist. And she studied her work uh, from a quote by Giordano Bruno, which sounds like nothing is more uh, helpful uh, to, uh, to iron than rust, which is produced by itself. And uh, Anna um, reflects uh, on the nature of uh, destruction and self-destruction common for humans to, to the same extent that iron is a subject for uh, corrosion. So she created uh, a series of rusty metal objects uh, and placed them um, to such attractive um, frames in a uh, white cube space. And uh, um, she invited viewers to uh, discuss about the normalization and making aesthetic of destruction. And according to the concept of uh, my ghost gallery guest, this series of works by Anna was supplemented by my participation uh, with the sound from the Under the Dome project. So it um, contrastly, contrasted sharply with um, objects marked uh, with traces of rust and uh, destroyed um, the illusion of uh, their um, aesthetics. So since I can recreate, cannot recreate this space um, experience uh, from the distance, I would like to complete my talk by playing the sound from my project. Um, Maybe I will turn my camera off now. Oh. Or maybe not. Okay, uh, but um, I suggest you to take your eyes off monitors or just close your eyes uh, and to listen to this um, uh, fragment of sound. So that's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anastasia and uh, Andy, for your presentations. Um, and uh, we're going to have some time now for some uh, questions from the audience. And just to start off the discussion, I have a question to both uh, speakers about how you work with your sources, archives, etc. cetera. Um, for example, Andy, in your book, you describe the witnesses accounts mainly from indigenous Evenki about what happened in Taiga, right? And you address how these accounts were filtered through the Soviet system of ethnographic knowledge at the time. 
And uh, Anastasia, you talk about how you find traces of the meteorite in written sources, but also in material culture, such as ruined house you found, right? So that also becomes your archive, an archive of traces, we may say, right? So what were the challenges of fi finding those sources and interpreting them? And what was your approach to selecting those sources? And also, how did you work with those um, enthusiasts who create their own online archives, right? Uh, online or offline archives and collections of sources about Siberian meteorites. Should I go first? Yeah, um, go. I mean, I'll, I'll kind of start where you ended off. I mean, the, 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 there's an easy answer to this, which is, of course, that um, I depended on them. The, enthusiasts um there's a, a very valuable um website collected uh, and curated by the um members of the complex amateur expedition that digitized numerous sources now i'm a historian so what i would always do is i would like read you know use that as the start and then dig up wherever i could possibly find the original copies of the sources um either pdfs or archives or libraries and then consult with those, but um, uh, the digitized stuff has made 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 the uh, selection of materials uh, on site very um, sort of pinpointed. Like, okay, I'm going to go to Volgograd and use Kulik's family's archive for two weeks here, and I'm going to go to Tomsk and look at the stuff that's not actually been digitized from that archive. And uh, mm -hmm. I was able to do a lot of that type of stuff. Um, and I was able to do oral interviews in Tomsk and that um, I wasn't necessarily anticipating that and it kind of happened serendipitously while I was in the field that, you know, I reached out to one person and then she introduced me to 25 others within th a three week period and was able to sort of talk to them and get their impressions and, and um, all of that. The, the, the harder question is about um, especially with indigenous voices cutting through a lot of the the layers um that the material that we have has been filtered i mean i am definitely not on the camp that like this stuff shouldn't be used just because of uh how it was influenced um not i mean and just to clear, this wasn't just like the, the uh, uh, uh like ethnographic sort of glay gaze on it this was like the people who were collecting the Venki testimony in the 1920s were helping build Soviet institutions um and like engaged in you know things like I tricked the Venki to get to them to talk about the meteorite by pretending like this and like it was very very sort of um fraught uh in terms of the sort of imperialistic dimensions of it um, that said, uh, there are versions of it that have been made available where, you know, some of the stuff that was published um, had excisions and you're able to kind of have been able to go back and look where the excisions were and where there were um, different parts of it. So, you know, I kind of, my, the approach I ended up settling on is a balance. Um, I tried to actually use Evenki, you know, filtered Evenki voices as much as I can to extract, to describe and recreate the experience from a narrative angle, and then kind of pull back and be like, yeah, but let's 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 analyze the filtering that occurred to, to even get us to have this perspective. Um, I can talk. I could probably talk about this topic for for hours and hours, but I'll stop it here. Thank you, Andy. That this is probably uh, I don't know another article on this <laughs> is coming out. <laughs> Anastasia, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, actually, I uh, behave myself as a cheater, <laughs> or maybe it's just um, intuition. I don't know, or maybe it's uh, also an approach or a part of approach to be a pilgrim, to go to uh, some places and maybe to ask some locals about uh, events or what. Uh, uh, what they remember about uh, meteorite um, fallings in last uh, decades, or even um, all my tries to um, uh, to go to the archives were 
uh, by accident, actually, uh, thanks to my friends who, um, one of my friends, she, uh, he made uh, research about Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, church uh, in Chelyabinsk, and he asked me to make some pictures of archival um, folders. And uh, we just uh, asked for another folders, and uh, then we found um, correspondence with meteorite uh, committee uh, okay. about one of the meteorites which um, uh, fell in twenties, and it was absolutely surprising by accident. So maybe um, my strategy is to be pilgrim um, also in. Um, in work with um, such archives and um, newspaper articles. Of course, I go to libraries and uh, some official places, but uh, most of the time in this uh, research, um, I uh, behave as a pilgrim. Fascinating. So in this case, archive actually found you. <laughs> um, and I have uh, another question that connects to this question uh, about the role of imagination and uh, personal experience to sort of complete or write your narratives, right? Um, and I know that, um, Angie, you sort of uh, visited the region and saw the epicenter from the helicopter, right? Which is fascinating to me. And Anastasia, I know that um, you said that you, you you go on the journey, right? So journey as a methodology of experiencing um, the environment is very important. Uh, and um, also imagination in your work, probably both the imagination of um, your interlocutors or people who actually engage with uh, meteorites and your own imagination as a scholar and um, artist. Um, in sort of creating uh, those narratives or understanding um, what happened or um, how those events influenced uh, people's interactions um, with the landscape. If you could just uh, speak to that. Whatever. And okay, I guess I'll start. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, uh, the imagination of the, the the historical actors is just like, you know, immediately a fascinating thing for me and was immediately um, something that I spent a lot of time putting my head, like my approach was to actually investigate this being like, I don't know what happened. At the end of the day, like if I'm just truly honest, pretty convinced by the mainstream explanation. And I didn't, I didn't go into that being like, I'm going to, you know, be a debunker, I was like, I want to really understand why people think this was aliens, right? Like, I, I really did go into that. And so I, I did go through a lot of sort of trying to think through what um, the process of their thoughts and 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 be very respectful for their thinking, because a lot of these people are, are, are quite interesting. So there was that part of imagination. Um, as a quick aside, I do want to mention that um, one of the main guys, um, this guy named Gennady Plahanov, who was started in 1959 going out to it, it was Chalabins that actually convinced him, oh no, it was must have actually been, uh, Tunguska must have actually been a meteorite um, uh, uh, at the end of the day. So it was, it was he was he had held on to it well into his 80s and then, and then changed his mind finally. Um, but uh, in terms of my own imagination, I mean, imagination is one way to think about it, creativity. You know, I did write this book in a way that was trying to engage with like literary nonfiction and, and it was influenced by these types of strategies. Um, one thing I kind of realized though early on um, is that, you know, I don't really, like, I think mystery is extremely important for this project and explaining the next one, but I don't read mystery novels. Like that's not the genre. And so like, I actually ended up kind of embracing this more sort of like firsthand observer kind of making making jokes here and there type of narrative voice um as my own way to express it i mean it's still i'm still making a character out of myself where i bring myself in i mean doing all of these types of things but it that felt more natural to me than to be like i really was just so befuddled by 
what had caused Tunguska because that 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 felt disingenuous. That didn't feel genuine enough to me. Whereas, you know, talking about being in the in the Lenin Library and like sitting down with a Yeti researcher for two hours uh, and kind of like laughing about it, that that felt you know kind of a, a voice that and a persona that I could embrace in my in the attempt to render this liter in a literary form. Um, as for me, the imaginary, of course, uh, is a, a base of my uh, work, but it also um, really um, sharply con uh, connected with my, um, my, with my uh, viewing uh, of uh, documentary category. I mean, um, I used uh, documents and uh, try to reimagine them, to rethink them, and to move them into the landscape, uh, just to um, to show to the uh, on the place uh, and uh, to say that this place is is uh, the place of meteorite fall, or this one, or this one. So I work more with um, mental map, which um, be is becoming a more topographical or geographical and then I remove it uh, from the uh, from the place uh, to uh, back to the mental level uh, where I uh, recreate all these um, images um, using um, approach of reenactments or different performative uh, rituals or actions so yeah this is the base I guess Fascinating uh, how documented sources and imagination and personal experience work uh, in creating in uh, creating narratives for both of you, right? Um, there's uh, a question from Professor Branson about the role of media. Um, I'm fascinating, uh, fascinated by the role that media outlets uh, played in both 1908 and uh, 2013 in transforming the cosmic disasters into a broader cultural phenomenon and even suggesting um, hypotheses. Do you think there is something distinctive in how the media covers these kinds of disasters? Is the media the source for these notions of mystery? And another aspect of this question is the impulse to imagine these disasters as connected to political or military events. Is there a meaningful connection between cosmic disasters and warfare? I mean, that's a big question. Um, I think I think we're in such different like if we're talking about Chelyabinsk and Tunguska, we're in such different media environments and we're um, analyzing them. So I do think that there's a similar sort of role, but really in the Tunguska case, you're not seeing that until 1928. You're seeing that about two decades after it occurs, where the media is really starting to play this sort of sensationalizing role. I mean, there was some bit of like sensational reports that. That came out, but they were they were pretty short, and they didn't have this long afterlife uh, in the immediate aftermath. So just like sort of change in communications, but but I do think they play a really important role. And and in the later Soviet period, um, I think it's extraordinarily important that you know the voice of a lot of these sort of wild ideas about Tunguska are things like uh, Technika Maladolji and. Uh, these other um, uh, uh, technology for the youth and these other sort of um, scientific popular science journals, you know, have like essentially the Tunguska beat, right? <laughs> like like well, at least once a year, there's something giving a new theory about Tunguska um, and some sort of thing, maybe not once a year, but but it's a common topic in these in these in these popular science. Outlets, so I think by that point you you're you're having it, but that's also very different. I think that's a distinctive Soviet phenomenon in some ways. I mean, you don't have like Scientific American publishing these types of things at the time. You have there, there's there's a different type of realm for that um, in 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 other parts of the world. Um, there's something else about that question that uh, I wanted to engage with, but I'm not recalling it right now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up for a second and see if I think about it. 
Okay, Andy. Um, as for all these um, visual documents, um, there was really overabundance of documents uh, uh, connected with, related with Chelyabinsk meteorites. And uh, of course, they played a huge role uh, in conspiracy theories. So one of the locals in Cheberkul, uh, Nikolai Melnikov, um, who is um, a, the only one person who uh, has a specific video of fallen meteorite right to the lake of Cheberkul, not in Chelyabinsk. He um, believes uh, into aliens and he builds all his uh, theories based on looking uh, all this abundance of photographs and videos uh, from the web. Uh, and he uh, breaking uh, every pictures into pieces just to show, oh, look, look, it's some of UFO. Uh, they are uh, they're carrying the meteorite from Chilabinsk to Chebarkul, right to the lake, just to, um, to take care of people of Chilabinsk and Chebarkul. And he also, um, be, uh, he also built uh, one of these uh, private memorials uh, on his um, territory next to his um, house. And there is a sign of this uh, memorial uh, to those uh, aliens who saved the Ural from uh, space catastrophe. So it's the, um, it's the answer of how um, all these visual documents influence on um, theories or expectations uh, of people uh, who was, uh, who wore or not were um, the witnesses of this event. The, the, uh, that, that reminds me of one of the thing, uh, theories with Tunguska that happens that kind of emerges in the 90s is there's this guy, Yuri Lavbin, out of uh, Krasnoyarsk, who his take was, no, there was, there was a normal meteorite that caused Tunguska, but it, the aliens who secretly live underground blew it up and, and, and deflected it and prevented it from, from being a disaster. So it, it was... It was a very different sort of alien scenario that, and he like claimed, had these rocks and was like, "Look, here's the Tunguska meteorite," and and our people were like, "Well, no," but, um, but that that was a similar that that that's a similar type of theory as, as what you were just saying. Uh, it was about the military that, um, I I don't know. I mean, there's like it's really hard to know, right? Like, because uh, um. There's the direct context uh, in 1908 um, in both the um, both the ja Russo-Japanese War, but also the Revolution of 1905. So some of the some of the early testimony was like, oh, this was you know priests saying, hey, like this was this is re God's revenge for not, for 1905 for for for, for trying to um, overthrow or not overthrow, but protesting against the monarchy and whatever. Um, the the later on there's sort of real connections between especially when everything becomes nuclear that and and sort of war efforts but then there's other parts of it that are that i that i think are a little bit more like well this is just this playful not very important element um you know i so i i think it's complicated i don't think it's 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 uh there's something that like leads these cosmic disasters to necessarily be seen through military lens, militaristic lenses, but 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 that is one lens that sometimes gets applied. I guess that's my best answer. Oh, and uh, there's also a question um, about another lens with um, with which we can look um, at those events. Uh, in particular about sort of similar religious patterns that seem to uh, come up here, uh, the um, evocation of mystery and the pilgrimage as a way to think through these events, right? And uh, perhaps uh, you, you could um, reflect on this common in your work turn uh, toward religious or spiritual notions. Uh, 
Okay, and this is the question to, for me. Oh, uh, for yeah, that, most of you, yeah. Um, um, it's uh, actually, uh, I, I see the question, the next question uh, here in chat and um, it uh, quite close to this um, previous question for me, because uh, for me to be as a witness of uh, Chelyabinsk meteorite fall, um, this, uh, this experience has changed a lot. <laughs> even in spiritual way, because I was a quite religious person before that. And now, no, I'm not. <laughs> Here's my question, uh, my answer. Uh, and um, one thing when you read about all these events and scientific books or articles on you see the movies and another one when it's your personal experience and it quite change. Uh, it it change um, the. Um, I don't know uh, the expression, the viewing of the whole world. So and um, for me, um, maybe this um, approach uh, as a, a be a pilgrim was, of course, I, uh, I've told that it was not such religious uh, approach um, in general, but uh, when uh, I had started uh, this project, uh, it was more like that. Uh, I mean, uh, to make this pilgrimage uh, to the landscape and to find something which is uh, such sacred for you, so I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> um, in my case, I would say it was more, you know, just talking with the people and, and seeing it the, about the spiritual um, reflections. Um, I do think that a lot of the people, so a lot of the people who are interested in UFOs and other paranormal, paranormal phenomena in the Soviet Union um, were, were kind of had this sort of new age spirituality element kind of going on, and and some of them very much that blossoms in the nineteen um, in the nineteen nineties. Um, others others are not. I mean, others you know uh, this is one of those things that is always an interesting thing. Is like I mean because the people some of the people I spoke to these were lifelong communists and who were still very much like yeah of course I'm an atheist you know they're they, they had they had a very different I mean there might have been a spirituality there but it was a it was it was it was um a sort of atheistic spirituality or at least an, a, a spirituality uh reflected through uh Soviet atheism um there's also, of course, the interesting part about Ivenki um, spirituality. And again, I only get a bit there and it's through these um, uh, uh, difficult to interpret ethnographic sources, but um, I am pretty confident that that there were, um, that, the event, that a number of Ivenki viewed this as an, as an intervention of a spirit um, and that was the cause of it. Um, and uh, that kind of gets erased, I mean, like in, with Soviet religious oppression, I mean, right, and class oppression, right? I mean, the main thing, of course, that's happening in the 1930s is that shamans are, are declared cool, essentially playing the class role of kulaks, and there's a, a really violent campaign against them. So some of the people of uh, Ivenki who actually help with these early expeditions are later declared kulaks and executed in 37. Um, so there's that whole sort of realm of it um, that uh, I was only able to figure out so much above it. And I, I kind of want to actually try to wade more into um, even deeper into sort of like the, the qual high quality anthropological literature about Ivenki to, to, to see if I can make more sense of these sources. But um, uh, that's, yeah, that's a big part of um, 
the experience of a lot of them as well. In my own journey that I don't, you know, I, that was, it's not really kind of how I came to it. Uh, if anything, it was more um, sort of from a sort of intellectual standpoint of I mean, my first major book was like, it's like sprawling history of a place trying to like tell us everything, trying to like think really big about um, the environmental history of the Soviet Union. And I wanted a like concrete event, idea, place to sort of, and then like use that as a tapestry to consider all sorts of, of subjects. So that it was, if anything, the event actually kind of led me on the path to the, to the um, uh, from a sort of standpoint of intellectual curiosity. Well, our next question kind of uh, builds um, upon what you were just saying, Andy. Uh, did your in-depth engagement with uh, this impactful natural events and transformed uh, landscapes reshape your perspective on the relationship between human subjects and the environment? And I know uh, Anastasia already started uh, in some ways to answer this question. So whoever wants to take it. I can go unless you want to continue, Anastasia. Um, I guess I, I've already answered it. No? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, I, um, you know, I was already sort of interested in this idea of environmental subjectivity, the ways that different both processes of um, thinking about the natural world as something that humans are supposed to have stewardship over, but also then engagement with the material nature could shape human subjectivities, um, both in terms of uh, intervention into some of the historiography of the Soviet Union and Soviet subjectivity, as well as um, sort of, I mean, to, to be very crass, bring Latour into a Foucauldian conversation from a theoretical um, perspective. Um, uh, but, uh, the, the, the real way, so like I was already pre um, predisposed to be kind of thinking about subjectivity, I guess, when I would, came to this topic and came to this material. Um, but for these individuals, I mean, it just became so, you know, every front one from Kulik to these, um, people who chose to spend the same, their summer out in the bug field. Like it became so clear um, how deep this was in their own cultivation of their personalities and ideas. So it was less actually the disaster than the mystery. It was the, the mystery experienced through going to this place, being themselves pilgrims. You know, I tried to be a pilgrim, but I didn't get, I only got to the helicopter, but um, the, uh, uh, that, that, um, that really just becomes so, so defining for 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 a really you know significant number of them not all and i think that's important too is that it wasn't all because you know it's one i i, I liked focusing on those who like you know wrote poems about their how much they loved the taiga and how much they loved their experiences there and all of this um but then there was you know a number of these people who like went were miserable hated it never went back again they went you know, and, and I actually think that that's really important that there's this diversity of um, of uh, subjectivities that, that emerge through this these historical experiences as well. Thank you, Andy. And before we um, wrap up, I'm wondering if uh, Andy or Anastasia have um, any questions to each other, uh, since there's so many uh, similarities that occur between your two projects here. I mean, I could ask a lot of questions. I think I found your work extraordinarily fascinating. And and um, I'd like to, I mean, I've seen stuff on the website and in this presentation. I, I would really love to be like at actually one of these exhibits at some point, um, as difficult as that might be to imagine right now. But um, the I, I am really curious about where, where Tunguska kind of comes in and like some of the people you talk to um, and, you know, is it a common reference point um, when people are talking about Shalabinsk or some of these other meteorite falls that um, that um, you've investigated uh, for your art, um, or is it 
more of an afterthought? Is it like not really the focus when people are coming up with these spiritual ideas about um, what might have happened in Shabansk or like how, I mean, obviously there's connections there, but like how conscious are the people of these connections is what I'm, what I'm kind of getting at. Uh, you know, it's uh, more common. I mean, this comparing with Tunguska phenomenon is more common for scientific sphere. Uh, all these comparings that it's uh, Chelyabinsk is the second after Tunguska and so on. But um, if um, talking to just people outside the scientific sphere, maybe uh, it's more common to to hear uh, comparing with um, nuclear bomb. So it's more. Um, more uh, military um, images or symbols because uh, as I've um, I talked uh, as I told uh, there are a lot of uh, conspiracy theories contacted with uh, military uh, with uh, different disposals of uh, ammunition and so on so that's why oh, also it's a trace of the region where there was um, a disaster uh, on the chemical plant called Mayak in Azorsk in 1950s. So that's why um, I um, heard a lot of comparing with nuclear bomb or um, more uh, human disaster than another one. Yeah, it's paradoxically, but um, maybe it's Paradoxically, uh, paradoxically outside, but inside, it's more common to to compare these events. Yeah, but um, I have to say that it's uh, really a great pleasure for me uh, to be here uh, today uh, to to look uh, to listen to your presentation too, because it's. Uh, a really a great match between uh, research, despite of uh, our different approaches. So it's really nice. Yeah, so um, thank you both Andy and Anastasia for sharing your work with us today and for a wonderful and thought provoking discussion. Um, I'm actually very happy that we were able to put your project uh, together um, today. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone who attended the webinar today and to those who will watch it online, online later. And I hope this and other conversations uh, will continue across the disciplines and across the borders. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.